I was told way back, uh, you really need to plan your exit strategy from day one. I think in the next five years, the key driver to value within the management rights industry, once you take away the P&L, um, is going to be the relationship with the body corporate. I think that will drive value or indeed undermine value depending on the demeanour of that relationship. Yes. I absolutely believe that um, and make no bones about it, the banks believe it as well. We're asking questions today we were not asking three years ago. Hello, this is Christine Lehman of Raz Rights. Thank you for joining us. We create these videos in order for you, the on-site manager, to hear from experts in the industry and learn from their years of experience. Today we're joined by Mike Phipps of Mike Phipps Finance and Chris Kennedy of CBRE. Now, Chris Kennedy has actually had over 2,000 valuations under his belt, so he speaks from years of experience there. And one of the things I admire about Mike Phipps is through the hundreds of projects he's been involved with, not one has been in default at all. So to me, that speaks highly of customer service and on so ongoing support. Today, we're going to hear from them about what's actually been going on in the industry today. Certainly, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of permanent management rights in that area. Um, it, it's a pretty desirable place to live. So um, if, you, if you're netting sort of in that two to 300 range, um, my view is that you know, we've certainly seen multiples there in the five times. Um, being driven primarily by a desire for people to have permanent management rights. So there's still a thought in the market that there are, I guess, a lower risk transaction, um, albeit with lower options for return. So it, it's more difficult to value add um, and so more difficult to drive the net profits up. Chris, how are you seeing it? So yeah, we're seeing essentially a lot of people who are uh, first up uh, in Coomera. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people who are actually buying themselves uh, a job uh, in Coomera. Yeah. And that's why I, I agree with Mike when he says we're looking at, at the fives, the low fives in Coomera, uh, where your net incomes are in that sort of 200 to 300. Thousand dollar range. Okay, you've also got a situation in Coomera where you've got a lot of investors uh, in Coomera as well, uh, and um, the product it was specifically designed uh, when it was built in the 90s and the early uh, 2000s was specifically built for uh, investors. So it's not a bad place if you're looking for a first time up or even a second time up for a permanent uh, management rights. Uh, Coomera is not a bad place to be in, uh, and as Mike says, I agree, it's not a bad place bad place to live. We've got to go back to what I've said before, um, if you've got that, that security of a, a reasonably nice place to, uh, to, to live, you've, you've got a job, um, you've, they're mainly larger complexes, you've got plenty to do, plenty to keep yourself busy, plenty of mowing, trimming of palm trees and all that sort of thing, uh, which keeps you busy, uh, and um, yeah, it's, not, it's not a bad stable income for you. Yeah. The multiplier, I've, I've um, compared it to a dark art, really. You know, <laughs> wizardry. It's <laughs> alchemist. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really a dark art. Um, and in fact, I've been asked to speak on this on a number of occasions. Uh, obviously, the way we speak, uh, we sort of apply in the sort of seven out of ten rule, uh, where this what we say relates to seven out of ten properties. But obviously, there are other properties uh, where obviously you've got some form of advantage there uh, in terms of not having to do those things. So obviously, people will pay a premium. Uh, for that, um, so they're getting a good income, and they're not having to do all the mowing and all that sort of work as well. So yes, I, I, I totally agree. That, and, and if I was asked to value the property, I would have agreed with that. Oh, yeah. So we've just uh, done some transactions out, out that way. Um, in fact, I've just been visiting some clients there this week. Um, I think that area has still got some growth left in it. Um, I think the proximity of the commute to Brisbane is really important in that area. Um, I think Chris makes a really valid point about Coomera, which, which equally applies in that area. And that is that it is an investor market. Certainly the banks look at it and what they're thinking about is for the multiple our clients are paying, what's the risk of losing units out of this letting pool? Um, and with some exceptions for some of the really upmarket four and a half, five star residential properties, I think that risk is relatively low. Um, it comes back to what Chris said, and, and that is that if the market for you know, a very vanilla, generic sort of property in that area is five times, then you've got to look at what are the drivers that are going to either drive that multiple down or up that are outside the norm. Um, certainly being able to live off-site is a really big one at the moment. Yes. Um, we're not huge fans of managers living off-site from the get-go. We're of the view that they probably should reside on-site for a period of time, build a relationship with the body corporate, then look to move off-site. Um, it's, good for your, it's good for your value, it's good for retaining the relationship with the body corp, 
Um, my view for what it's worth is that relationship with the Body Corp is worth real money. And if you can demonstrate as a vendor that you've got a wonderful relationship with your Body Corporate, my view is that your building is worth more as a result. Christine, the challenge in that area is, is, is some of the smaller buildings that are making, you know, let, let's say below 120,000 net, yes. um, the component of real estate in those transactions can be proportionately pretty high. Yes. Um, when that happens, obviously the return on the overall spend drops yes. um, and, and that can really hurt the multiples as well. So, um, but again, as, as Chris points out, the demand is there for first and second time buyers. How are you finding it? Yeah, listen, um, uh, Hope Island has had a bit of a chequered history, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. N not necessarily when it comes to management rights, but in terms of the development of the, of the, um, of the entire island. There was a lot of excitement around um, Sanctuary Co Hope Island Resort uh, in the 80s and the early 90s. And then everything went pear-shaped uh, for the entire market, but particularly for those peripheral markets where you were, bending, where you were spending a lot of money on, on a house or a unit in a place that was essentially between two places. Uh, and so it did struggle there for a while, um, but now it's certainly coming back and it's a lot stronger today than it was, say, five, ten years ago. Um, so, so that's good for Hope Island. And I ultimately think it'll be a premier address to live on the Gold Coast. Ultimately, uh, yes, yeah. In terms of that northern end of the Gold Coast, which I think is a, 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 a very good spot to live, particularly if you work in Brisbane. Uh, if you drive the highway, uh, at all, uh, as we all do, you'll see the number of people commuting between Brisbane and the Gold Coast is phenomenal these days. That piece of infrastructure is, is, is gold. So, you know, being able to have a, an environment where you've got an upmarket environment with all your marinas and your shopping centres and all that sort of thing, uh, and still close to the Gold Coast, still close to Brisbane, it, uh, that's, that's the real plus for Hope Island, which I see. Okay. Uh, but we've had a little bit of history in terms of the development which has gone there. Okay? Uh, we've had generally had upmarket residential properties, uh, residential apartments, which have been built in Hope Island, which are now up to 20, 25 years old. Um, so uh, if you're a manager in Hope Island, you're in a great spot, but perhaps you might have a little bit more work to do when it comes to maintaining your relationship with your body corporate, maintaining your relationship with your, with your individual owners, because you're gonna have to be asking them to spend money. And that's, that, that, that's a big hurdle for some manager. And that's why you need a, uh, probably a second time round manager or a third time round manager who can handle um, uh, the expectation of owners uh, in terms of their return and then putting back and putting money into that, into that product. Mm. So yeah, overall, yeah, I agree, it's a really good market, but it's probably a little bit more difficult than your average Coomera market. Mm. In the Coomera, you might be asking the owner to perhaps uh, re-carpet and repaint in Hope Island, you're asking for a little bit more. You're asking for the kitchens to be done up. You're asking for the bathrooms to be done up. Because people expect, if they're going to be paying $700 a week, yes. that they're going to have nice. Yes. And that's what you've got to do in, in Hope Island. Yes, that's exactly what you've got to do. Yes. You've got the beautiful golf courses there, the marinas, the shopping centres, all that sort of thing. And so you are attracting a different type of tenant to that, to that particular market. Look, the volumes in that area are pretty slow. I yeah, very slow. Um, you know, yeah. There's not, there's, I mean, for a start, there aren't a hell of a lot of management rights businesses in that precinct. No. Um, yeah, there are there are a number of golf course based resorts, but, but there's not a hell of a lot of management rights. Um, we've probably you know, not seen sufficient volumes to get a real handle on where things are moving. Um, but I think we've got to look more broadly and say, if, if you're in a location that's got a pretty reasonable commute into a major CBD area, still pretty close to the Gold Coast, and you're running a permanent management ride, so something that's you know, seen to be, I guess, at the lower end of the risk range, I see no reason why those multiples shouldn't be holding up to the same sorts of levels that Cooma is holding up at, or indeed Runaway Bay. Mm. So again, that two, three hundred range, um, I'd be gobsmacked if those buildings weren't getting somewhere around a five multiple. Um, Chris makes a really valid point about upkeep and maintenance and one of the differentiators that we're seeing and people are buying is if, if they notice that the sinking fund is awash with money um, and certainly if you're making a decision about paying five times for a building as opposed to maybe 5.2 and the sinking fund's already got plenty of dough in it and they're about to spend and the place is going to look absolutely pristine, I see no reason why you wouldn't pay that 5.2 multiple for that property. Yeah. Okay. And Christine, I think you make a valid point in regard to the, um, the relationship between the manager and the body corporate. And we certainly look for that now. We're looking to uh, read the minutes of the uh, body corporate meetings for the last two years, just to see how that relationship is going and how... Yeah, 
Two years. Yeah, we're having to go back that far uh, to, to make sure that we're covering off on that aspect and to make sure that you know when things are asked to be done up, uh, the, the body corp is actually spending the money. There's a relationship between the manager and the body corp. It's a healthy business relationship. It doesn't have to be you get together every Friday night for, for, for a glass of wine. It doesn't have to be that. But it has to be a good professional working relationship and, 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 and that's really important. We're asking questions today we were not asking three years ago. And I think that that's um, a reflection of the market is becoming more sophisticated. Even though we have less time to do that today, it, it, uh, uh, the banking industry and the management industry are demanding greater disclosure, greater transparency uh, to make a proper business decision. And I don't mind that. I think that's a really good thing. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of complaints that uh, a lot of people step into the industry without knowing a lot about it. I don't think that's right. I think the people who step into this industry are well advised with, within this industry by specialist people within the industry uh, and they make a proper business decision. It, nine times out of ten. It's, it's my view anyway. Yeah. In your famous words. Certainty equals, equals value. value. Thank you very much for that, for the introduction, <laughs> Christina. There was, there, was a, there was a free plug, thank you for that. Um, yeah, certainty does equal value, and I think that comes out to every aspect of the transaction. If you can see certainty in that, or you can see opportunity. I, I should also stress that opportunity is something that we now stress within the analysis of any business, the opportunity going forward, whether that's positive or whether that's negative. And that can reflect very much in the multiplier. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's really two areas uh, in, in my mind, Christine. There's that uh, probably main beach down to Burley, um, you know, one street back from the coast. Um, and then there's the Varsity Rabina area, which is obviously a, a huge area for permanence and also for student accommodation. Um, we're seeing, I mean, we've, we've recently funded a, a, a very large permanent management rights transaction um, um, somewhere near Southport. Um, that building achieved a 5.8 times multiple. Um, it was valued at 5.7 times. Um, and indeed, that, that's a reflection of the market moving fairly quickly in a fairly bullish manner. Um, and we don't bear any grudges for a valuer that can't get to that if it's at the top of the market. Because the valuer is looking at, at historical performance and trying to judge where the market's moving. So our clients still bought the property on a 5.8 multiple. Um, they view, and they're very experienced. So they understood um, the asset they were buying. We often get asked as financiers who've been in the industry a long time, what should I pay? Um, and so we go through quite a similar process to what Chris goes through when he was asked the same question. Um, it's, it's a real trap for young players. Um, the, the, there's, you know, multiples in excess of six times have been paid for management rights since the GFC. It, it doesn't mean that the guy with the little holiday building with 12 units in the letting pool making 120 grand a year is going to get six times, but sadly some vendors think that is the case. So I'm a great believer in have a look at comparable sales in the market, decide whether your property is comparable and if you think it's worth more than the comparable sales there have to be good solid reasons why. Um, uh, you know, in, as I say, in the case of that permanent property um, it, it had a very strong supportive body corporate, it's in a fantastic location. Um, it's not really a building where people are going to want to reside as owner occupiers, so you're not going to see a dilution in the letting pool. So for those reasons, those those buyers were happy to pay 5.8 times. Brilliant. And a fairly fresh building as well. Um, not particularly. Um, it, it's it, I mean it's not brand new. I guess it's not that old either. Um, it's it's uh, what would it be? It's probably 10 years old, I suppose. Um, so certainly that's the sort of multiple there. If we move into um, into Surface Paradise and what's interesting is there's some permanence in the back of Surface Paradise and a couple of those canal estates where you know, we had a client pay a 5.4 multiple recently for net profit of under $200,000 um, to get the position. Um, they wanted that position and they were happy to buy the property eyes wide open based on that. Um, but that was a, a pretty extraordinary multiple and not one that I think will hold up in the broader market. My better judgment would have suggested you actually should have paid less for the property because there's quite a, a significant real estate component. Yeah. Um, but my clients wanted to live that lifestyle in that apartment and were prepared to pay for it. Um, and there is certainly some of that going on in the market where people are saying, I don't want to live in that horrible little dog box, two bedroom apartment that the developer didn't really even think about 20 years ago yes. when he built the property. Yes. Um, yeah. I want to live somewhere nice. Um, we're seeing a move toward younger people buying management rights so they've got children. Um, and they're just they're prepared to pay that extra amount um, to get into the building that's got the nicer part. Yeah, Christine, if I was uh, to do that particular property, I would go back to the definition of market value. And three very important words that um, are contained within that definition. 
That's, you, you have a willing buyer and a willing seller, obviously, but they're acting knowledgeably, prudently, and without compulsion. Okay. So, you, yeah, so um, that's in a sense where I need to go uh, in terms of my assessment. Uh, obviously, Mike is absolutely right. Uh, I'm looking at historic sales, then I'm looking to where the market is going uh, in that reality. Uh, but then I say, well, listen, perhaps there was a special reason why this particular person bought that pro property and they wanted to pay a little bit of a premium. And that's absolutely correct. And I'm happy to acknowledge that within the report. But on, strictly on the basis of the definition of market value, where you have uh, a willing buyer and a willing seller acting knowledgeably, prudently, without compulsion, I feel as though perhaps a slightly mo a lower multiplier might have applied uh, in, in that particular instance. And I, 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 I try and make that clear. But really, because at the end of the day, it is up to the bank and it's up to the, the buyer to, to make the decision uh, as to the way forward. It's not up for, to me to do that. It's simply to put a, one piece of information in front of them that hopefully might uh, allow them to make a, an informed decision. That's it. You know, but people are most welcome to pay a little bit more if they, want, if they have other reasons to actually want to pay a little bit more. Mm. More than that. What the banks will say is they'll lend against valuation or purchase price, whichever is the lower. What we're seeing is more often than not, the bank will say, we'll make up the difference. Providing you can service that debt, they'll say, okay, we're going to lend against Chris's valuation. It's a little bit less than contract, but we're prepared to make up that difference on a short term loan. Um, we love it when that happens because it's the bank saying, we have so much confidence in this transaction. Um, we understand why the value has come to his number, but we're actually happy to lend a shortfall, um, admittedly over a shorter term, and the, the borrower just gets to pay that amount of the debt down. But more often than not, that's what happens. Um, it's, it's very unusual um, for a transaction to, to fail because the valuation came in a bit low. Normally what happens is there's a combination of some discussion between the agent, the vendor, and the purchaser. Um, and you know, they might meet in the middle, for example, and that's not unusual with the bank making up the difference. Yeah. Also, Christine, in a lot of these transactions we're seeing today, there's income, which is in fact outside the traditional definition of income for management rights. Okay? Yes. Every manager now essentially has a full real estate licence. Okay? There was one in particular case of a, a very large twin tower uh, permanent complex in Southport. Okay, which bought on a very high multiplier, which we actually agreed with at the end of the day, because as you saw the potential going forward, not just for the income within the management rights business, but outside the management rights business in the sale of units, because there was a track record there. The current managers were already selling a lot of the units within the complex, and good luck to them. They were making a very good income out of that. So that's another factor which is now uh, in, uh, impressing upon the current market that perhaps you might pay a little bit of a premium over what you pay for the traditional management rights income. Okay, Which we as valuers, we can't count that in, but we can certainly say, well listen, when you talk about opportunity, you talk about potential, that's there. But that, then that goes back to, to the potential of that particular new manager to be able to perform as well in terms of the sale as the old manager. And that's something that we don't know. And we've recently seen the same thing on the northern end of the coast with a, a five-star permanent residential property where um, a client paid, should have paid probably 5.2, 5.3 times, paid 5.5 times uh, for a net profit in the late 300s, but on the basis that they knew that there'd been a long history of being able to sell units in that building. The average apartment there is probably 1.1, 1.2 million dollars. Yeah. Um, you don't have to sell many of those on a 50-50 split with an agency yes. to make quite a lot of money. People will pay for potential. Mm. They'll pay for um, a capacity or, or an opportunity to, to do something in the business that may not be in the P&L, but they can see they can crystallise. And that might be sales. Um, it might simply be that you're buying a permanent you know, uh, townhouse development at Coomera where the manager doesn't, doesn't mow the, the, the courtyards for the owners. Um, if, you're mowing, if you're mowing 52 courtyards twice a month at 10 bucks a courtyard, at 5.2 times that 10 bucks a courtyard, um, that's a significant add on. Um, and, and our clients will certainly pay a premium to get that, just as they won't pay a premium for something that is obviously completely maxed out. Um, if there's nowhere to go but backwards, then you know, the argument is probably why pay a premium. Chris, you mentioned in the past that banks don't usually value businesses under the $1 million mark. So I'm going to have to leave it up to you, Mike, to discuss or to like enlighten us about what's going on in that part of the market. 
Well, that's a market that I probably don't know a lot about. And I'll be honest with you there. And that's because the banks don't, generally don't get them valued. Generally, uh, the, the major banks will only uh, require a valuation if the lend is in excess of a million dollars. So as a valuer, we generally would not be involved in those, unless of course we're involved for some other reason. There's an internal reason why they might want to get them, uh, get them valued. So uh, we tend not to see those uh, transactions uh, come mm. across our desk at this point in time. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. So thanks, Chris. Yeah, sorry. Um, so it is true that the banks have, have limits where they don't get the management rights business valued. Those limits are generally based on two things. How much are you paying for it? Um, how much are we lending? But also the multiple. So if someone is, decides to pay a, an out-of-market multiple, it could be that the bank will decide to instruct Chris to, mm. to have a look at it. Um, but nine times out of ten, that won't be the case. Um, I think what that has done has led to, to probably that's, that lower end of the market getting quite hot, mm. um, quite bullish because there hasn't been a valuation process to, I guess, put some checks and balances in place. Um, what we have seen to some degree, although I think it's starting to cool, is people paying quite quite high multiples for what I'd consider to be relatively low net profits. So in that sort of maybe 120 to 180 net profit range, um, we're seeing multiples in excess of five times for permanent buildings. Um, that's arguably getting, getting pretty bullish. The swing is coming back to holiday, so yeah, not not, not forgetting that, that after mm. after the GFC, everyone took a terribly big deep breath yeah. and said we want to de-risk ourselves. We think that permanent management rights are less risky. Um, you don't have the risk of tourism demand and what have you. Um, that pendulum, I think, has swung mm. almost completely back now. Um, we are seeing quite large syndicates getting back into the holiday market, for example, which is always a great sign. Um, and I think you know, people are feeling pretty good about the exchange rate, they're feeling pretty good about international tourism demand, um, and we are seeing, I think, a, a closing gap between multiples for permanence and holiday, Chris. Is yeah, absolutely. No, I, I totally agree with that. Now, whereas before, I, I agree with Mike, that uh, people did swing back to that certainty in terms of the income, back to the permanent, but now people are, I think, emboldened by probably at least two years of pretty good numbers on the Gold Coast. Um, I think um, that the local council are doing a reasonable job when it comes to the approval for new development within the, the Gold Coast region, so we're going to see some new buildings coming out of the ground. In fact, I'm talking to a number of clients at the moment about the valuation of off-the-plan projects here on the Gold Coast. Mm. And that's an interesting thing, and that's particularly in that sort of broad beach uh, surface paradise market at this point in time. Mm. And honestly, we don't have a pointer because we don't have a sale. That, that's our reality. Mm. So I've said to a number of clients, well, we would obviously look to Brisbane first. We've had off the plan projects in Brisbane, mm. but they're predominantly permanent or perhaps a combination of corporate, uh, short term corporate and permanent. That seems to be the, uh, the majority of the product in Brisbane. Or we have a look at existing product on the Gold Coast and perhaps soften the multiplier side so to come back to a multiplier. But there's a lot of people who are looking to get into that market into that brand new market here on the Gold Coast. And I think that that's pretty exciting. And they've got expectations of paying multipliers in excess of five times mm. for off the plan product here on the Gold Coast because they see the strength of the market, they see the existing buildings as older, uh, and we all know, we all like new, don't we? Yeah. We all like to, you know, we all like to come, fresh. we all like fresh, we all like to come out of our homes into a lovely new fresh apartment, we're at holidays, you know, beautiful TV, nice big leather lounge for the guys, of course, uh, and, and everything you need in this brand new apartment. Well, that's what the new uh, the new buildings will give you. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm seeing a lot of excitement in that market and a lot of smart people. I'm not seeing first-time people. I'm seeing a lot of smart people who are looking at that market and saying, "Listen, yes, I'm prepared to pay five times or excess." for off the pan product because I know it's almost guaranteed that that will be a success because of the strength of the market, particularly in service paradise and, and, and Broadbridge. Like I know there's been a lot of talk about bikies and violence and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but I honestly think that the former uh, government did us a great favour by, by, yeah, by, by doing what, uh, what they did and I think that that's made the Gold Coast an attractive place again to actually holiday. Mm. Yeah. You know, I talk to a number of managers uh, on, a, on a daily basis and they're all saying that their numbers for this year are up on last year and last year's figures were up on, on, on the year before. Mm. So, so they are really good and that's right because 
you know, in any evaluation that I do, I look at the relationship between the occupancy and the average daily rate which they achieve for every booking mm. uh, which they do. And both of those numbers are rising at this point in time. So it's, it's mm. really good. Moving away from off the plan, Mike, you mentioned some results we've been having in Burley. Certainly, I ran into a, a client um, went down here last week who's got the largest holiday building in the Burley area. And look, I've got to tell you, and they won't mind me mentioning this, you know, two years ago they were you know, not having the best time of it. Um, their business is absolutely firing. Um, they're good operators, um, but, but that, that stretch of the coast is, is really going gangbusters at the moment. Actually, Burley's a good case in point. You've got a number of sales in Burley now, mm. uh, and along the Esplanade. You, in fact, you've got three of them. Mm. Okay, coming from Burley, you got three of them. Right. Okay. Now, and the one that was further south, closest to the hotel, yes. um, there was obviously a lot of issues um, between the body corporate uh, and the managers there. Um, and so that sold at a lower multiplier. Then perhaps the one at the northern end of the Esplanade, where there wasn't an issue between the body corporate and the manager, good manager, uh, and the multiplier there played was significantly more. Than, than the one at the southern end, although the income was relatively the same. There wasn't a lot of difference in the, in the income. So when I go to value property, I, I'm not, uh, people think that I need to have a look at the unit. Well, yes, I'll have a look at the unit. That's the first five minutes. You know, the other 55 minutes is taken up with finding about exactly how you run your particular business. Now, if you're a manager who would prefer to clean the pool and mow the lawns, well, that's not the, mo the modern management rights manager. In today. It's about working on your relationship with your clients, they're the people who own the units. Yes. Working on your relationship with the body corporate committee, because that, that, that's your business. And, you, uh, and then making sure um, that you're achieving the best average rate, daily rate, yes. uh, and the best occupancy for your building that you, that you possibly can, by, by maintaining your standards and maintaining your marketing systems. You know, I have a little bit of a story which I'll share with you. Uh, when I was a lot younger, when I was in fact um, the eldest of five children, and in the middle of a uh, year, there wasn't, wasn't a lot of money in the Kennedy family, but in the middle of every year, we used, to, we used to jump in the car and we'd come to the Gold Coast and my parents would go to a couple of local real estate agents and they'd get a couple of addresses of some houses, some you know, asbestos fibro houses, uh, Nobby's Beach or Mermaid Beach, and we would uh, go around, we'd have a look at the houses and we'd pick one out and, we'd, and then you'd see us at Christmas time. Okay? Today, of course, everybody gets on the internet on Thursday night they, they do their booking on uh, whatever airline that they, they prefer and, and they book into the complex which they prefer and that's all done by 9 o'clock on Thursday night and then they're here on Friday afternoon. So it's a completely different market at this point in time. So the monitored manager needs to be on top of that whole marketing process as well as on top of their relationship with their owners uh, who are in fact their stock and their, and, their, and their body corporate. And I think that was a perfect example in Burley where there was about a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 split in the multiplier uh, on properties which had a similar potential, uh, but because of that relationship, mm. that's, that's where their market ended up for them. There's a dollar and monetary value attached to making sure that you leave your body corporate chairman a bottle of wine in their unit when they stay in your building. It's as simple yeah. as that. There is, there is a multiple attached to that spend. Um, and modern managers get that. Um, mm. Some, I guess, don't. But Christine, at the end of the day, it's a business. Managerise is a business. And that's where we've got to look in terms of the, of, of the valuation. So if we see a good business with potential to grow, that's when we're happy to move to a higher multiplier. If we see a business where there's been a breakdown in the relationship between the manager and the body corporate, well, of course, we're going to be cautious, even if the income is quite high. You know, I've seen uh, it was a particular uh, building uh, at Spring Hill uh, in Brisbane, which was a short co corporate building. Okay, the, the income there had gone backwards, had gone backwards, and the uh, relationship with the body corporate had gone backwards. Uh, was, I don't think it was anybody particular fault uh, at that particular time, but you know those people uh, who've gone in now have been able to mend that relationship. They will benefit in terms of the value going forward mm. uh, for them. Yeah, it's yeah. all about sustainability. Yeah, yeah. and and if. if People who own units in your building that are in the letting pool don't like you and start taking those units out of your letting pool, nothing will undermine the value of your business and your income faster than that. There is yeah. no economic trend that will keep up with people just not liking you and removing their units from the pool. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, as, it's as simple as that. Relationships. Cause Absolutely. Because if, if you look at the net operating profit from each particular unit on a unit basis, yeah, it may be anything between $5,000 and $10,000 per unit for a short term. 
holiday building. Now, if you take one unit out of the uh, out of the bottom, out of the letting pool, there's anything between twenty-five thousand and fifty thousand dollars in the reduction in value. So it's very important to keep your units within the uh, within the letting pool. Yeah. Then you have the double whammy of that person not voting for your top up at the next general <coughs> meeting. Absolutely. Um, you don't get the top up. You've lost some more value in your business. So that mm. that's difficult. What do you think about the the southern end of the Goldie? What do you think about Kira and Cool and Gatter and Rainbow? Um, it's uh, it's yeah, uh, it's a market which we always traditionally thought was a three-hour drive market. Okay. Yeah, that's what uh, we term um, the particular type of client that you normally would get to that area is the three-hour drive market. Drive out of Brisbane, Warwick, Toowoomba, uh, places like that. Okay. It's not like that anymore. Uh, you've got the airport there. A lot of the people who booked in on Thursday night the closest accommodation to the airport because they don't want to hire a car, uh, they just want to jump in a cab or whatever, on a bus, uh, that's in that Coolangatta, Kira area. Yeah. A lot of really nice development down there, I'll particularly mention the uh, reflections buildings uh, uh, down at Coolangatta, um, uh, uh, Blue Sea, um, yeah, uh, uh, Con Nicofridis has built a couple of beautiful uh, buildings down there, uh, uh, Kira the Kira Surf um, uh, building, world-class buildings uh, for an area which is a little quieter, uh, a little more family friendly and I think becoming attractive to the market who are flying there. I asked, it's a loaded question because I've just spent uh, just spent 10 days there with my wife and family and um, I don't think there's, there's a more underrated tourism area in Queensland, on the Queensland coast, than that end of the Gold Coast. Yes. Um, I spoke to a lot of managers there. Um, the area is certainly performing, mm. um, uh, but I think if there's value in terms of uplift in tariffs and occupancy, I think it might be there. But you know, there's a bit of a mindset if I'm going to buy management rights on the Gold Coast, there's sort of this surface paradise thing, and um, that's certainly changing, no question about it. Mm. Actually, that particular building brings up the question of the standard regulation module versus the accommodation regulation yes. module, which is another industry development within the industry within the last couple of years. If you'd asked me that question three years ago, I would say, well, standard regulation module, don't particularly like that, because it doesn't matter what I think, if the market doesn't like it, well then I've got to reflect that within evaluation. I think, we've, I think we've, in the last couple of years, we've seen a bit of a turnaround in terms of that. And we've had a number of buildings now, which are sold in that sort of 4.95, five times multiplier, yes. standard regulation module. Yep. But we've seen history of those agreements being topped up every every two years. Right. So we have a good uh, relationship between the owners and the body corporate. Yep. Uh, we're seeing incomes in all of those buildings in excess of 300, probably, probably closer to $400,000. Yep. They're in good locations, Severs Paradise, Main Beach, uh, Cool and Gatta, those sort of areas. So I think that possibly uh, we should not be as negative as we were, still cautious, uh, as we should be, but not as negative as we were perhaps uh, three years ago in terms of the standard regulation module, mm. particularly if you've got a good relationship between the body corporate yes. and, and, the, and the manager. Because oftentimes those buildings are in premier locations, yes. Yes. right on the water, they're, you know, perhaps they are an older style building, but they're in premier locations where people, and I'm sure that those managers in Coolangatta, Rainbow, Rainbow Bay, have the same thing. People have their holiday one year, and the last thing they do before they drive home or they fly home, is they book in for next year. Correct. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Which yeah. is what we've just done at Coolangatta. Yeah. Uh, our clients actually go further than that, Chris. Our mm. clients say to us, if I'm looking at a building that had 25 year agreements and they're down to 15, mm. the demeanour of the body corporate is yet to be tested on the yes. top up. Yeah. If I'm looking at a 10 year building, yeah. 10 year standard module, and it's yeah. been topped up every two years for the last yeah. goodness knows how long, some will say, I think I have more certainty of maintaining these agreements than I do in a 15 year building. Yeah. And that may or may not be the case, but it's certainly evidence that the body corporate is supportive. In fact, the burning question is, why is it at 15? That's right. Has the question been asked, <laughs> and what was the answer? Uh, yeah. Um, which is which is interesting. Albeit we we are gobsmacked at the number of times we look at a transaction where the agreements are quite short, and we do some digging and find that there really isn't anything much going on, except the manager just didn't think it was something worth doing. Yes. Uh, which is amazing. Yeah. The business side of it, not the the unit, the business is a diminishing asset because, in a sense, it's a 25-year right 
to uh, maintain the common property under the caretaking agreement and to have a non-exclusive right to let the units within the building. Now, if that agreement's gone from 25 years to 15 years and never been tested with a body group, there's got to be doubt in the market's mind as to why that's not happened, mm. you know. Well, there isn't it. Exactly right, mm. Chair. Now, there may be a perfectly innocent reason why there hasn't been. Either party, great relationship, didn't think it was necessary, okay, let's get it topped up for the new owner, that's no problem at all. But more than likely, there's another reason. Mike, while we were chatting earlier, you discussed the fact that none of your complexes has ever gone into default. How do you maintain that sort of track record? There's a number of things, Christine. Um, I'm an ex-banker, so um, we tend to approach these transactions the same way a bank would, so we actually say no to a lot of transactions. Um, there are finance brokers, not necessarily in this industry, but more broadly, who probably take any application that comes across the desk. Um, we will often say, we're sorry, we can't help you, we think the risk is too high. Um, that doesn't always go down well. Uh, once we've settled a transaction, part of what we do is work with the client, particularly if they're having a bit of a rough trot, um, to make sure that we present you know, what's happening in their business to the bank in the most positive way. Yes. Um, the banks love that. Um, okay, they don't want to hear that things are down, yes. but they like the fact that the client hasn't stuck their head in the sand and just tried to make it go away by ignoring the problem. So we work with our clients to say, okay, what's happening? That's interesting, you've lost a couple of units in your letting pool, um, we do need to tell the bank about that. Let's first understand what's going on in your business and then let's present the strategy to the bank about why they shouldn't be concerned. Um, so we've been in the business now, out of the bank six years, we've never had a client default. Um, we've had to go to the banks on occasions and say, hey, this is happening in our client's business, but we always present and here's the plan. Um, we just don't have a problem with that. We, we have a duty of care to do that, um, but we also, um, you know, it, it probably sounds a little a little crass, um, I just think it's really good karma to look after people. They will say nice things about us and it's the best form of advertising we have. Um, our repeat business and, and cross-family and cross-business uh, referrals is fantastic. Um, you, you simply can't just desert your client after settlement. Tim O'Connor has recently rejoined me. Uh, Tim had five years with the Light Rail Authority, uh, putting in that beautiful uh, tram we have now on the Gold Coast. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, which I think will be a catalyst for a lot of good development on the Gold Coast. And I'm already improving the holiday yep. situation. So yeah, very, very excited about that. Uh, that's right. And um, Katarina, uh, who's a, a master's student out of Bonn University. Uh, and uh, originally from Russia, uh, originally, uh, but she's now a Baliwa and she's helping us out as well. Uh, and so what we're looking to do going forward is to provide a lot more financial analysis into the, into the uh, values as well, trying to add value to, um, to the valuation. It's not simply two numbers, a number on the unit and a number on the business. I think the market is looking for a greater level of sophistication and an analysis when it comes to evaluation. So we can see uh, perhaps you know the good things and the, the not so good things in the current business, but how are we going forward to create a better business uh, into the future? And that's where I see the future of valuation as an added value to the service that perhaps you provide and the, perhaps the service that, that Mike provides uh, and to the bank. So we're looking uh, to provide an opportunity for people to grow their business uh, into the future as well as know where perhaps there might be some issues currently within the business. Yeah, so try, that's right, yeah, and, and, and well, not necessarily correct them, but you know, bring them bring them back into balance. Because sometimes there's just been a word said here or a word said there that yes. might have, you know, yes. put things out of balance and it's easily fixed. It's e easily fixed, that's right, geez. Yeah. Well, thank you so much once again for joining us. We will keep sending these videos to you just so you, the on-site manager, can keep your finger on the pulse of the management rights industry. Till then, this is Christine Lehman of Raz Rights.